Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, here's your host, Jason Day. Hello, friends, and welcome. I'm your host, Jason Day, and I'm excited for today's episode of the Church Leaders Podcast. I am joined by Leonard Sweet, preacher, teacher, theologian, and scholar. Len has served as professor, dean, and president at a variety of of educational institutions, and he currently works with graduate students at Drew University, George Fox University, Tabor College, and Evangelical Seminary. Len preaches and speaks at events around the world and is the best-selling author of more than 60 books, including his latest, Rings of Fire, Walking in Faith Through a Volcanic Future, which is available now from Nav Press. In this episode, Len and I discuss how we, as pastors and ministry leaders, can live out the mission of God in a culture that is growing increasingly hostile toward Christianity. Len shares the important shift the church must make as we point people to Jesus in this radically changing culture. It's a shift from here I stand to there we go. Len speaks of the hopeful future the church has as we embrace a concept that he terms simplexity. So please now, won't you join me in my conversation with Leonard Sweet. Len, welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. So good to have you joining us this week. Great to be here, Jason. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, Len, um, I want to dive right in um, because you have served the church over the years as sort of this theologian, preacher, teacher, futurist. You've been a prophetic voice. I remember years ago uh, when I was in seminary picking up a copy of Soul Tsunami and um, and that book and (laughs) And being simultaneously kind of blown away, you know, kind of mind blown experience reading through that, but also super encouraged because, you know, what you were writing about were, were, were things that as a young minister that I was sensing and I was seeing. And it, it was so good to, to know that I wasn't just out there somewhere floating around that, that, that you know, there were others who were seeing uh, what, what we we're seeing taking place in the culture and um, I had so many highlights, honestly, Len, a little post-it notes stuck all through that that book, and it really helped guide my ministry as a young young pastor. And uh, it's um, encouraging to hear. Thank you. I wish more people had have felt that way. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, <laughs> we honestly. wouldn't be where we are today. So what? Right, think, right, right. You yeah. know, as, as I picked up your your latest book, Rings of Fire, um, I, I I sort of had this. Um, you know, kind of time travel moment a bit. You know, I was like, well, Len's doing it again. He's always giving us a peek um, ahead so we can assess kind of where we are and where we're headed as the people of God. So, so super appreciate this book. And the subtitle is Walking in Faith Through a Volcanic Future. And so, Len, I, I was just curious, um, can you share with us kind of the significance of the volcanic imagery? Yeah, well, it, that's a really good question, because this is written consciously as a 20-year um, kind of update on Soul Tsunami. And I, I started a long time ago doing this kind of side gig as kind of a, uh, what, what I call, I don't call it, it's called semiotics. How do you read signs? And so I, I started doing this semiotic kind of railing of the culture and and helping the church to watch you know we're better at watching out than we are watching and um preachers are really good at watch out watch out watch out but Mm. there's a deeper sense of just being a state of watchfulness and watching and they used to have a a watchtower with um you know people that were um, watching and so i'm just on the watch trying to help the church watch and um, read what i see on the horizon and um uh, help the church to see what is what is on the horizon, and and so I started with a book called Faith Quakes, where I talked about how there was an earthquake had hit the culture, and that was back in that was my first attempt at that, and and then I realized that it was worse than a the landscape hadn't been changed; it was really a tsunami. Mm-hmm. So that's when I got the soul tsunami, um, and it was funny because that I had to fight the, the publisher because they first of all they said uh, nobody's going to know how to spell it much less pronounce it I said, <laughs> I said trust me they will and uh and sure enough uh it, it, uh, now everybody can spell it and pronounce it and has images for it right and um so that but then i realized now 20 years later that doesn't even go far enough that we're, we're living in a, a culture where we've got all these 
volcanoes, and some of them are super volcanoes that are erupting and are ready to erupt all over the world. And so it's 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 gone from a uh, earthquake to a tsunami to now a uh, a series of, of volcanoes. I live actually on a on a fault line, and so I and right at the heart of the, these rings of fire, and so the the the, the title just came kind of naturally. But um, they, these are molten challenges that we face in the future, and 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 the world is is facing uh, volcanic forces, and it needs volcanic leaders to to meet those volcanic forces. So I'm really calling here for um, for, for some volcanic churches and volcanic forces to erupt to to meet fire with fire. That's how you fight fire. Mm. So it's really not mega anymore. It's magma and, and <laughs> not ma- mega leadership but magma leadership and uh, we, we need there are lava flows everywhere and and so we need that kind of uh, magma response to a magma culture i initially had jason 49 uh, rings of fire and the publisher got it down to what is it 25 24 or mm-hmm. something so this book was a lot bigger. <laughs> wow. We could talk for days. Yeah, it, we could talk for days. It's got like uh, 600 pages off this book. So. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, these I, I love the kind of the, the volcanic imagery because um, with volcanoes, you know, um, they're volcanoes that are currently erupting with lava flows, but then there are volcanoes that are, you know, bubbling beneath the surface, you know, and, and ready to erupt. Exactly. And, and so you have that anticipation. And, and, and that's why I, I think in the book – you share a lot of things that are that are currently happening, but how those things that are currently happening are pointing to, you know, a potential eruptions down the road, and, and how we as uh, uh, ministry leaders, as we as the church, um, need to be um, not just cruising along, but being kind of cognizant and aware of of these bubblings, so we are not so reactionary when they happen. But how can we get in front of them? Right. Exactly right. Exactly right. It's not. You, you've got to seize the future as as it's forming, and uh, so that's exactly the point. And 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 I really, it's a really hopeful book because the best soil on the planet is lava rich soil. Mm. I mean that's that's why there's on the front of the cover there's a coffee bean hidden on the in the in the ground because the best coffee in the world, Kona coffee, comes out of lava rich soil. And in uh, Philippines, you have these resurrection posts, these posts that literally come back to life because they are uh, surrounded by the, by the, the lava fallout and the, the, the mists of uh, these volcanoes, and they create such a rich soil that they start growing again. So it's a great time for the church, but it's, it's, it's a whole different culture. I mm-hmm. mean, it is such a different culture, and if we still think we're in the, you know, the, the culture where the church and the world wash each other's hands. You know, the church and state had this, we'll wash each other's hands. Well, this, the state now has washed its hands of the church. Mm. It wants nothing to do. It's a post, not just a post-Christian, but increasingly an anti-Christian culture. Um, we're no longer playing home games anymore. The, right. the crowds are not cheering for us. So that's the, that's the shift. And if we don't make that shift, th- th- these could be some very dangerous and, and uh, damaging days for the church. But if we can make that shift, back to where Jesus was in the first century and the kind of culture that was faced by those early Christians, where the crowds actually cheered for the lions to eat them up. Mm-hmm. If we can realize the power and the potential of that, I think we got some great days ahead. So, Yeah, let, let's let's dig in a little bit on um, kind of this, this hostile culture that, that we are experiencing to a degree and it's just continuing to grow. Um, one of the things that you say is that Christianity is the future's go-to honeypot for ridicule and abuse, and that the gospel has always gone against the grain, but the grain has been friendly grain up until now. And so I think for a lot of us, especially here in North America, as you've mentioned, this is relatively new territory um, for most ministry leaders and pastors. So how— Yeah, it really, right, it right? really is. Yeah, exactly. And— I mean, I, I spend my life in academic centers at, in the Northeast and Northwest, and um, in in those acad- in, in any place in the Northeast and Northwest, especially in academe, Jason, if you say you're a Christian, you will pay. Mm. I mean, there there's a cost to pay, um, 
it's not just tolerance. It's it's there's a cost to pay. I mean, um, so even I mean, it's just the news this morning was the Supreme Court justice uh, was seen in a picture with Roman Catholic cardinals and priests, and immediately the call was you got to you you cannot. Um, Rule. You got to recuse yourself from any rulings having to do with all these social all these <laughs> issues. I mean, basically, you know, that's the we're you're, we're thinking this what? Right. But this is the new norm. This is the new norm, and we don't understand this. Uh, um, that that and and we misread it. I have a whole chapter in this, a whole ring of fire on the the harm it does to our thinking to think of it as secular. Mm. Um, and um, it, this is not a secular culture. It's a culture that turns everything into a into something that's sacred. It sacralizes everything. It doesn't secularize everything. So you have a sacred celebrity culture is a religion. Mm. You know, the market uh, economic is a religion. Uh, even atheists want to be known. We we have a religion. They want to be known as a, a religion. So this is a culture that everything it touches, it turns into an idol. It turns into a um, a, a religion. It's not secular. It's it, and it's more than pluralistic. It, it's it's very um, you know polytheistic, if mm-hmm. you will, and plural. P l u r o theistic means you 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 bring them all together in one world religion, and you have this pantheon of gods, and they're all equal, and we're all equal here. And, and and in that pantheon are all of these um, um, worshipings that we have for you know, we worship cons- consumption, uh, the market, a nation. I mean, I could go on and on. So this is a I think we misread the moment if we think this is a secular culture and it has no use for anything sacred. No, this is a culture that that is so hungry for the sacred that everything it touches turns into a sacred ritual. It just doesn't call it that. Right, right. So then, Len, how, how can we as mystery leaders best, you know, honor the mission of God as we live in a culture that is increasingly hostile to the things of Jesus and is setting up everything else outside of Jesus, as you said, as an idol? Yeah, well, and that's where we can really learn here from our Eastern Orthodox uh, sisters and brothers, um, because they have understood the power of icons. And um, Protestants have tend to see icons as, as almost idolatry itself, but it's really not. The function of an icon is to point you away from that picture towards something greater. The idol points you towards itself. The idol wants you to worship it. The idol says, look at me. Mm. The icon says, don't look at me. Look through me. Look beyond me. Look around me. But look at, I'm just here to uh, frame and to focus something greater than I am. And in a culture where everything is an idol, including the self, we've got to learn to be icons, icons of Jesus that say, don't look at me, but look through me. Because this is a, you can't, you can't escape this. It's a celebrity culture. The whole world now is a, is a global celebrity culture. And, and we, have, we, we have a global soundtrack. I mean, we, you've got some, some YouTubes out there with more hits for a, for a song than there are people on the planet. Hmm. I mean, so every, the whole planet is listening to the same musicians, the same songs. We we are uh, kind of kneeling at the same secular altars, if you will, the same, which which are not really secular. So uh, we've got to, in that kind of a culture, to indigenize the gospel in that, we've got to say, okay, we've got to rise to the occasion. But So we need, if you will, um, these magma uh, prophets and these magma preachers and these magma planters and um, magma churches, but the point is not look at me. Mm-hmm. The point is for this is that's that that you you've succumbed then to the idolatry of the culture. Right. You've become not just in the world, you become of the world. But we're to be in this world, but we're not to be of it. Which means you do, any idolatry is to be rebuked, and um, we are willing to be then icons of Christ in a culture. And an icon does, says, "Don't look at me. Look." beyond me to the one I'm pointing to, and I'm pointing to Christ. So we got to point to Christ. And this is one of the problems of our churches, Jason, is that 
you know, I, is where's Jesus? Mm. Where's Jesus? I mean, I, I'm I'm less concerned about the decline of Western culture and and Western Christianity. I am the missing Jesus in Western churches. I mean, a lot of our churches, you you, you go to you go to worship and. The sermon has nothing to do with Christ, how to make you a better person, how to make you a better um, a husband or better wife, or all is very happy, happy and happy. And mm-hmm. no, no, we are there to, to lift up Christ. And if he be lifted up, it says he will draw. So we're not the draw, he's the draw, we're there to, to lift him up. And um, and so that's the, that's the challenge, but it's also what a golden moment, what a golden opportunity. Yeah. For sure. Now, Len, I love how you kind of emphasize the kind of public life of Christianity that um, that the church exists in the midst of. You even said that, you know, uh, not of the world, but in uh, in the world, you know, it's uh, that we exist as a church within all this all this change and all this culture shift and and even the the hostility and and the violence and the difficult things that are are taking place. But we as the church, we exist within that. So can you talk to us a, a bit about and you touched on it just a little bit, but I'd love to, to get a little bit deeper. The idea of prophetic discourse in the public arena. What does that, what does that look like for the Church? Well, it, it looks very different than it's, it seems to be looking right now. And right. that prophetic discourse right now in the Church seems to be, people think they're, we're, we're speaking truth to power. So we're going to take a stand, and we're going to stand up, to, and we take stands. And, um, you know, the, the Protestant... Reformation 500 years ago uh, was built on these three words, here I stand. And Luther stood up to the greatest power of his day and said those three words. And those three words just shook the world. I mean, just revolutionized it, because it was here. And the, the world of his day had been living in the past. Luther said, no, I'm claiming the present. And then Luther claimed his middle word, I. We have no idea the concept of an individual where you get to make your own decisions, choose your own partners in life, choose what you want to do for a living. All that stuff is so recent in history, and Luther claimed it in that one word, I. Um, And then stand, and he had 95 theses, remember he did, 95 stands that he took, you know. And the first one, by the way, was repentance. It's always a good one to begin with, (laughs) it's repentance. So he started, so he had 95, so this is the modern world. The problem is that world is gone. It's collapsed. It's crumbled. And so each one of those words is wrong for the world we're in, but we're still trying to do what we think is prophetic witnesses by, here I stand. Mm. No, it's not here, it's there. It's the future. God is calling us to the future, to join him where he already is working. He comes at us from the future, pulls us towards him more than pushes us from behind. He's already there. And then not I, but we. We've taken the I as far as we can take it, Jason. We've gone from individualism to rugged individualism to narcissism, and there's something even beyond narcissism, which is called solipsism, or where you live in your own universe, where you think you're the only one that is there. I mean, I call it a universe, Y-O-U-N-I-V-E-R-S-C, a universe of one. And, and that's where the self becomes the major god. So it's got to be we. And then it's not stand, it's go. You, it's easy to take a stand, it's hard to take a hike. It's easy to stand against people. It's hard to walk alongside them. And the future is, is as we be in this world, but not of this world. That's the key thing, is to be in it, but not of it. Jesus says, well, do you more than others? So we are walking alongside people. For God so loved the world. doesn't say God so loved the church. God so loved the world. So we, we live in this world, this cosmos. Um, and we... Um, are there with a mission which is to save God's mission, which is to save and redeem the world. And and you begin with every single person. And that's how, um, that's the ultimate prophetic witness. Yeah, that that's good. And it's a shift, uh, I, I believe, a lot in, like you said, what, what we're thinking in the church is oftentimes we're kind of... Um, you know, like you said, standing up, and we're kind of pointing out. You know, these are the issues yep. around us, yep. um, as opposed to um, engaging more in, you know, the hike and walking alongside someone. That's engaging more in conversation and dialogue versus just, you know, pointing things out and kind of, kind of shouting. How, how do you see churches practically, like local churches? How do you see them kind of 
entering into this walking alongside? You know, well, I, that's a really, that's a really good question because yeah. you're actually penalized if you do it. Because mm-hmm. you're, how can you talk to that person? We have churches now more segregated by party than we do by race. Mm. I mean, this is a, this is a culture where uh, churches are are self-selecting. So you got a you got a red church and a blue church, and um, you know, it, it, my this is not the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of heaven, we're going to have generals and pacifists worshiping God in the same pew. We're going to have Republicans and Democrats worshiping God in the same pew. And we, we've got churches now that they're either one or the other, and, and uh, if you are seen associating with somebody else or saying a nice thing about somebody else, you're immediately uh, you're, you're compromising with the devil. So it's a huge... I mean, this, is how, this is how polarized this culture has gotten. And uh, this is so not the kingdom of God, where Jesus invited to his table. And I think it's all about the table and and bringing back the table, uh, the importance of the table. What replaces the the temple when it's destroyed in 70 in Judaism is the table. The most sacred rituals took place at the table. And this is how early Christianity began, is around the table. Jesus didn't stand at pulpits and lecterns and preach. He sat... sat at table, reclined at table, presided at table, um, and a lot of his teachings were table talks and table time. And, of course, the ultimate one is the, the Last Supper, the Lord's table. But we've got to bring back the table, and bring back the table to our homes, bring back the table to our churches, um, bring back the table to our neighborhoods. Why, why is the church not sponsoring uh, massive uh, block parties and mm-hmm you know, uh, tailgating parties in our parking lots. Uh, I call tailgating T-A-L-E gating because it's when you get men that will actually talk, <laughs> tell stories, you know, when they're barbecuing. And right. So why are we, not, so we got to, there's a wonderful Spanish word for this. Actually, there's a podcast that is named by this. And I, mm-hmm. I, I, I really tried to lock, uh, lock up the uh the name, and then I found out everybody else was using it too, but not in the church. It's called Sobra Mesa, S-O-B-R-E-M-E-S-A. And um, one of the ones that has SobraMesa.com are cigars. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, but I go, I, so, you know, John Wesley, the founder of my tribe, said, plunder the Egyptians. So I actually tried to plunder the Egyptians and get the URL from the cigar company, and they wouldn't have any part of it. But <laughs> But Sobra Mesa means uh, after Sobra Mesa, the table, which means that you, you would dishonor any host. If when you got done eating, you got up from the table. Because the major part of the table was all about the table talk after the meal. And so you would always sit around for half an hour to 45 minutes or more and just, and that hence the cigar. These are cigars you bring out at the end of, uh, this is especially in Argentina and, and other Spanish cultures. Um, it's the key about a meal is the sober mesa time. And it's interesting, you know, it says after the supper was over, he took the bread. So in some ways, the last supper is kind of sober mesa time. Um, and that's where we got to, we got to bring people together around the table. We got to bring diversity. We got to bring people that disagree. We got to bring, um, people of difference around the table and and spend time around the table um, eating and talking and learning from one another and that's the it's got to start there Jason it's got to start there and most of many many Christian homes don't even have a table mm. yeah. Where, where's our dining room or I don't care forget the dining room just give me the table anywhere put your table in the kitchen put your table anywhere in your family room your great room I don't care but where is the most sacred item of furniture ought to be the table in your house. And if we're going to have a future, we got to bring people, not just kith and kin, but we got to start treating neighbors as kith and kin. we got to start treating uh, people who disagree with us as kith and kin and bring them into a table time, table talk, and make a, make a big sober mesa time. Yeah, that's, that's good. Len, some people um, uh, have, have stated that they feel that the church, at least here in North America, has um, kind of, in a way, lost the battle in public, in, the, in that the church is going to only become progressively, 
you know, kind of pushed to the sides of relevancy in in just kind of the world, you know, and in, in, in the culture. Um, do you do you feel that that is going to be something that continues that the church continues to be pushed aside, or do you see um, an opportunity for the church to, you know, to kind of step in again and help lead and drive culture um, rather than just react to it? Well, that's a that's a big question. Um, it, to the extent the church says, "Look at me, we're a force." Um, we deserve a seat at the table, it's going to lose. Um, And it's never, the church should never be about the church anyways. The church is the body of Christ. And and, and the extent to which the church lifts up the body, the body of Christ lifts up Christ. And the body, in in some ways, is headless right now because Christ is missing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I say the number one disease in our churches is JDD, Jesus Deficit Disorder. And Jesus is missing because we made the church about everything else. Uh, we made it, politics has become a religion. The, it, people on both the left and the right that these are religious systems now that have their own rituals and their own um, anthems and and um, never the twain shall meet. So we've got to realize that no, the church is the body of Christ, and the body has a head, and the head is Christ, and we are there to lift Him up and to point everybody to Christ. Um, and the extent to which the church will lose itself in trying, and not try to save itself, but mm-hmm. to lose itself in lifting up Christ. And just say, but, but look at Jesus. And you don't, you don't even have to sometimes even name the name of Jesus in the, cult, in the wider public discourse. You can talk about the things that Jesus, tell the Jesus stories that he talked about. And a lot of times I'm quoting scripture, but I don't give a Bible verse. I just say, you know, there's this great story hmm. that I, I live my life by, and I tell the story. I don't go, you know, this is, you know, John 20, you know. I just tell the story. And if we tell the story, this culture is addicted to stories. Stories are catnip. It's the currency of the culture. And so our our job is to get these stories in the bloodstream of the of the public arena, to get the metaphors of who Jesus is. And and just to provide that kind of uh, framework for the culture, uh, not to save itself, but to lose itself in in lifting up Christ. That's good. Jesus says something about that, <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> about uh, not not trying to save yourself, but uh, but uh, he he was he, he kind of says something about that. So we can we can take that. I'm curious. One of the things that that you talk about and you've written about is this idea of the church uh, moving forward as as a simplex. You use this term simplex church. It, it, it alludes to kind of the paradox of of church as both simple and complex. Can you talk to us a bit about um, how that fleshes itself out um, as as we're moving forward? Yeah, it, this is partly the theoretical uh, kind of framing of this. Is that this is a culture that's Go, going in two opposite directions at the same time. It's not a bell curve world anymore. It's a well curve world. And uh, I, I've written about that a little bit here, but more so in Carpe Manana in another book I wrote about about 20 years ago, also just saying that this future was becoming increasingly polarized. Um, and the, and the, what's falling out are the middles, and the ends become huge. So the world's getting more global, and it's becoming more more local. Uh, so every church ought to see itself as a global church and to fall in love with its zip code. Um, so we're, we, we've got to, and Jesus, this is natural for us, because Jesus was was this way. I mean, Jesus always came in surround sound. You never heard one thing from Jesus. I'm the lion of the tribe of Judah, and you never stop there. I'm the lamb of God. I'm the mm-hmm. prince of peace, and I came bringing, what, an olive branch? No, I came bringing a sword. You know, he's he's fully God, fully human. I mean, we're built on paradox. So we we ought to be excited that now we're living in a world that is is, is by fundamental, uh, its fundamentals are paradoxical. It's going in two opposite directions at the same time. I mean, for example, this is these millennials are getting more and more apocalyptic, you know, I mean, just the world's coming to an end. It's gonna. We're, we're, we only got eleven years. Mm. At the same time, they're more utopian. Oh, we can we can end poverty. We can end racism. We can end evil. You know, and and so you're growing the same people. It's deeply schizophrenic. This culture. Um, 
when you've got this kind of th- opposite things going on at the same time. So how do you then survive in that and thrive in that kind of a, a, a oppositional, paradoxical world? And the, um, the 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 way in which Jesus did it is lived out of both fully at the same time. So, for example, the world's getting more complex, but but the world is getting more simple. And um, you know, you got simple church. You got houses are getting bigger. Houses are getting smaller. TVs are getting bigger. TVs are getting smaller. So we got to think. Complexity is good. Some some complex. Thoughts require complex sentences. Um, we need to be able to enter a complex world and deal with complexity at the same time if we ever lose that simplicity. And so I just put it together, and this is probably a good place to end even here, Jason, is that the older I get, I'm, I'm becoming more and more this paradoxical, uh, you might even call it bipolar. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going into I, I, my my theology is getting more complex, but my faith is getting more simple. Mm. And I am I write books, I write complex books, I write books on complex theology. I'm, my, my theology is getting more nuanced, more sophisticated. I, I, I have this theological edifice. Some people say I have an edifice complex, and I may. But every book, I add a new wing, or I add a new balcony, or I add a new something to my, my theological edifice. So I'm my theology is getting more complex, but at the same time, my faith is getting more simple, and it's just hardening around one thing. And Jesus himself said, unless you become as a child, so childhood is not something we grow out of, we grow into it. Unless you become as a child, you won't, there's no grown-ups in heaven, You be, unless you become as a child, you don't see the kingdom of God. So mm-hmm. my faith is getting more simple, it's all about Jesus my comp- my theology is getting more complex. So I bring them together in that word simplexity. But I put the simple first, because when I die, let me tell you what's going to be my lips is not all the books I've written, not all my wonderful theology and all of its complexities. What's going to be on my lips is um, just give me Jesus. Mm-hmm. Give me Jesus. It's, gonna, it's all about Jesus. And if I ever lose that simplicity of a child, I will have lost everything. Um, so... Simplicity, complexity, bring them together. Don't be afraid of either. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not it's not simple mindedness. It's the simplicity of a childlike faith, not a childish faith, but a childlike faith. So it's the simplicity on the other side of complexity, and so we live out of both dynamics at the same time. It's good, brother. Really good. Well, Len, it's been, it's been great to have you with us. Uh, I want to encourage people to pick up your latest book, Rings of Fire. Um, Len, if our listeners wanted to learn more, connect with, with you more, how can they uh, best connect with you? Well, if, you could, if you're on Facebook, I have, uh, I have a Facebook site that's personal, but it, it's public. So I've, I, I post little meditations or thoughts every day. I Preach the Story is another Facebook site. I provide resources for clergy called preachthestory.com, and uh, just if you just do preach the story, I also post little ideas, illustrations, animations, uh, things every day on there, and um, I'm on Twitter, um, and uh, so just lend sweet or preachthestory.com. Awesome, brother. Well, thank you so much right. for making the time to be with us. God bless you, my friend. Hey, great to be with you. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this week's episode. Every week as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders, and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. So we hope you're finding value from the Church Leaders Podcast. And if so, we'd certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcasts so they too can benefit from these interviews. Again, we thank you in advance, and if you have any comments, any questions, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email to podcast at churchleaders.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter. Finally, you can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app. It's available for both Apple and Android, and so we encourage you to check that out as well. So until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well, and lead well.
You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.